You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. This program is brought to you by Genesis Volatility, also known as GVOL, home of institutional-grade crypto options analytics. Whether you're trading CFI options or DeFi options, cryptocurrencies move. Use GVOL Analytics to analyze implied volatility, model realized volatility, structure positions, and unlock alpha. For more information, visit GVOL.io. That's G-V-O-L dot I-O. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. That music means it is time to break down all of the madness, the volatility, the skew changes, the open interest, the action, the world of crypto derivatives. Yes, it is time for the Crypto Rundown. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. I'll be your host, your guide here for this roughly one hour or so journey through the world of all things crypto derivatives. Reminding you, if you like what you hear, I know we have a lot of people coming to this show who are new to the world of options. All this stuff may sound crazy, weird, intimidating. You don't know what we mean by volatility or skew or even things like calls and puts. And we got you covered. Subscribe to the full network, particularly the Education Wednesday content, Options Playbook Radio options boot camp those two shows you listen to them in their entirety you'll feel a lot more comfortable you understand what the heck we're talking about here maybe you'll start slinging them their options in your accounts there of course a lot of other content waiting for you on the network so keep those ratings and reviews coming it really does help all the new folks we see coming in to discover the network these days give them a safe harbor in these troubled waters. And of course, keep those questions and comments coming too. You guys have a lot of them these days. As you might imagine, everyone's got Bitcoin and Doge and ETH on the brain these days. We do love to hear from you guys. Let's see who we're hearing from on the old program today. Joining me, Mr. Greg Magadini, the co-founder over there at Genesis Volatility, aka GVOL. Greg, welcome back to the Crypto Rundown program, sir. Thank you, Mark. Very happy to be here. So, well, exciting time in the crypto market. Yeah. Once again, I have to apologize for having you on at a boring time when there's nothing to talk about, sir. You know, <laughs> I, we have to stop doing this, bringing you on in these in these quiet, tranquil moments when nothing is lighting it up. Of course, I'm joking, listeners. Let's get to it. It is time to dive into the Bitcoin breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trending activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown, the portion of the show we break down all the action, the volatility changes, the skew, the unusual activity, the open interest, all that and a whole bunch more in the world's leading digital asset, a.k.a. Bitcoin, a.k.a. the thing everybody's obsessed with these days, including 
Elon Musk over there. Lots happened, Greg, even since the last time you joined us, which wasn't too long ago. So maybe let's start there before we dive into the price action and everything else. Catch us up. How are things faring over there in the land of Genesis? Well, I got to imagine you guys are fairly busy these days, sir. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of new participants just being introduced to options for the first time. So it's a great way for traders who are sort of new to crypto and are seeing these expensive assets, uh, a way to get exposure with a smaller trading account. So options are a pretty nice solution for some of those newer traders. And so a lot of interest in options in general, a lot of interest in crypto in general. We're seeing fantastic um, uh, private companies allocating their balance sheet to to Bitcoin and hopefully Ethereum here at some point. We're seeing new products come online with the CME Ethereum future. Chival is in the process of adding CME data. Um, we're also in the process of creating an educational YouTube series for, for traders who are new to options, how to think about options, how options work, things like that. And then uh, we have a lot of traders who are trading some of the futures derivatives as well. So there's a, there's a lot of nice cash and carry trades, um, basis trades to be done in the futures market. So that's, a, that's another data stream um, that we've been being requested to uh, add to the platform. So that, that's in the works as well. So it's pretty exciting stuff, no doubt. Yeah, it is exciting stuff. But speaking of which, before we even get into all this fun stuff, since the last time we chatted, a little birdie told me you may have uh, headed down to South Africa. Is that the case? And if so, what was behind that? Did you just want to get much closer to those new variants of COVID, sir? <laughs> no, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. We- well, I was not trying to bring back the new updated version of COVID to the United States. Uh, my girlfriend, uh, she's from there and her family's from there. So we spent some time over at, at over there with her family and we checked out the coast of, of Cape Town and it's a beautiful place. I mean, the nature in South Africa is just amazing. So it's, it's definitely worth worth your while if you're thinking about traveling there. The, Timing. Uh, yeah. I'm surprised you're able to make it there and back without getting a quarantine for, for multiple months out there. But I do love the South African accent. It's kind of like half Aussie, a little bit of British, and a little bit of something else sprinkled on top. It's It's got a nice little twang to it. But this is not the, not the dialect podcast, so let's keep rolling right on into all things Bitcoin here. As you might imagine, listeners, there's been a little bit of price action. We were off last week for the President's Day holiday, even though we did do a little interim show last Tuesday just to keep you guys excited and engaged because so much was going on. But going back to our last show a couple of weeks ago, now our last official crypto rundown, we've seen a big a big surge in Bitcoin. We were just shy of the 43,000 level on our last show, 42,800. And coming into today's show is 53,200, which is now ticked up. It's threatening 54,000, now 53. 900. So a pretty massive swing, well over 10,000 points just in the last show. Of course, we've seen multiple highs since that show. We saw the rally over 50,000, then at the 54,000. We saw it flirt ever so briefly with the 58,000 level. I mean, (laughs) Greg, it's kind of hard to put these levels into rational terms that the folks listening I can understand because it wasn't too long ago on this show. A few months ago, we were talking about someone buying the 36,000 calls and that seemed absurd. That seemed outlandish. That seemed insane. And we were also joking about, hey, maybe someday Bitcoin will hit one trillion. Well, guess what? It did that since our last show as well. One trillion dollar market cap. So sometimes, Greg, uh, it's my job to put these into terms people can understand. But sometimes I find myself at a lack for words when it comes to all things Bitcoin. Are you having the same problem? Yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting. My um, One of my good friends, he always kind of makes this analogy. He says, what if Uber as a private company, when you were investing in Uber as a VC, had a price chart to it? It would sort of jump up like this. Like it's sort of like a a VC early startup equity with a price chart to it. And so we're seeing as kind of Bitcoin breaks into the mainstream and institutional investors investing in it and then private companies are allocating balance sheet to it. It's actually just, it's a, it's a brand new paradigm. So earlier on, back in 2013, the big question was, will the government allow this to keep this happening? And I remember that was kind of the narrative for sort of a bearish market from 2013 all the way to 20. 20, early 2017, basically. And and now it's like, there's a brand new paradigm. It seems to be accepted. Uh, you have 
regulated entities who are willing to allocate capital to it. So it kind of enforces this idea that the government is going to let it continue on. And and even if they didn't want to, they might not be able to stop it, at least not unilaterally. So this kind of paradigm shift just reprices Bitcoin and you just have this huge step up in price. And now, now we're at this new crazy level. Um, it's very interesting. I like that analogy. Listeners, as you startups get rounds of new funding from different VCs and others, the valuation hopefully continues to increase. And we certainly have seen that with Bitcoin. You can the last round, certainly with Musk and Tesla buying one and a half billion. We have seen a lot of institutions now start to turn on the gaze, turn on the spigot, start taking another look at Bitcoin. We're going to see some of that reflected here in the numbers as we start breaking it down. Remember, you guys can crunch these numbers for yourselves. Gval. .io is the place we go to get all this data and analytics. I know you guys have been kicking the tires and lighting the fires over there as well. If you do that, pull up Deribit. That's where we're going to hang our hat. That still is the leading order book, even though you could you could look at some others and say they're starting to get some paper as well. We're going to hang our hat out there in Deribit land. The one-hour vol out there in Deribit coming into showtime was, well, last show was about 105%, so it was it was nothing to sneeze at on our last show as well. And it's still around that level, 109%, with obviously some intra-show, intra-week spikes much higher out there. You know, Bitcoin has maintained this north of triple-digit level of volatility for some time. And it doesn't seem like it's going to break that anytime soon. We were just talking about it on our last program, actually. Bitcoin has that type of volatility, that skew shape that is synonymous with a lot of commodities, where as it increases in valuation, the vol actually goes up. For a lot of reasons we've discussed on the show here in the past, the, the calls are usually bid, more volatility as you go up. The vol tends to increase. And, of course, you see sharp movements like we have seen of late as well. That also translates into a lot of vol. So for the time being, at least, we're hanging out in the triple digits at 109% coming into showtime. The one hour 30, 20 skew, which is that strip of all those options there in the 30 delta all the way down to the 20 delta there. Last show was nice, meaty 13 and a half. Coming into today's show, it has dropped a little bit down to about 0.5 in the negative direction. You know, Greg, why don't we do a real quick overview there as we get questions on this all the time. You know, what do we mean about the skew numbers when we're talking about these numbers here and the changes there? And we give people updates fairly frequently, but it's been a little while since we've given our audience a bit of an update. Obviously, we have a lot of new listeners out there. And these are your skew numbers. So why, don't you, why don't you break them down for our audience? What do I mean when, I, when we're saying we were at a 13 and a half? In the positive direction a couple of weeks ago, now coming into today's show, that skew has swung and has dropped to negative pretty much a half. Yeah. So basically what we're looking at is we're looking at all the call options that have a delta between 30 to 20. So it's sort of these out-of-the-money call options. And we're looking at the implied vol that those call options are averaging. And then we subtract the put options with an equidistant delta. So the put options with a negative 30 to a negative 20 delta. And so we compare those two volatilities. And so what we're seeing when we have a positive reading is that traders are paying more in terms of vol for, for, for a call in that delta range than they would pay for a put. So what we've seen in you know, mid-January, which, which was kind of as far as options activity goes, it was sort of the peak option activity season. And people were, were paying so much more for the call side than they were the put side. And that, and what we think about, the way we think about it is kind of like maybe a fear of missing out in Bitcoin price action. So they kind of hurry up and buy as many out of the money calls as they can so they can sort of get some leverage exposure. And that causes the calls to be relatively expensive. And so we like to see, we like to look at the skew to get an idea of where's the paper, you know, where's the paper flowing to? What are traders willing to pay a premium? Which side of, of the ladder are traders willing to pay a premium on? Is it the call side? Is it the put side? And the way you can kind of think of these numbers as well, it's it's not only like kind of a direction directional indication, it's also sort of a vol indication. So in a perfectly efficient market, if the call skew is more expensive than is if the skew is more expensive for the call side than the put side, you can think of it as as the as the spot price rallies, the implied vol or the, the realized volatility should increase along with the rally. So that's kind of how you, you think of a, a skew in terms of ball. But what we seem to have noticed is that it's also a little bit of a 
fear of missing out bid. And so we do think there's a directional component to that as well. Yeah, once Big Daddy Musk gets in there, the FOMO really kicks into high gear <laughs> out there in all things Bitcoin. Let's see how that's being reflected in the open interest. And it has surged up since our last show. Our last show is about 157,000 contracts open. Remember, one of the fascinating, one of the cool things we can do in the crypto markets that we still can't do in the quote unquote traditional markets of, let's say, your Apples and your Spies and your Teslas is check the open interest hour by hour. In fact, I just had a good conversation with the CEO of the Options Clearing Corporation on this network a couple of weeks ago. I asked him this exact question. I said, when are we going to be able to do this in the world of options? And he seemed a little more optimistic than I thought that we could at least get some updates on open interest more often than once a day, which is what we have right now. So let's take advantage of that. Let's look at the hourly open interest right now out there on Deribit. Our last show is about 157,000 contracts open. Coming into today's show is just shy of 190, about 189,000 contracts open. Now, that's pretty strong. That has been growing. Of course, it's well off of what we saw. It was close to a quarter of a million contracts open back right before January expiration. January rolled off the board, took a lot of contracts with it, and we still haven't uh, gotten back up to those levels, which may surprise some folks, given that uh, Musk and all the hardcore institutions are starting to I, all things, <laughs> all things Bitcoin, uh, but not quite yet there on the overall uh, overall options front. Now we get to the overall notional value, though, what they're putting on. That's a little bit of a different story. We had our last show, we were talking about $7 billion or so in terms of notional value. I mean, that's kind of the value of all of these outstanding options positions. Not my favorite way to measure than what's going on in the crypto space, but a lot of the folks in the crypto space like to do it that way. Come into today's show. Not quite, but close to two X. You're talking a little bit over 13 billion in terms of notional value outstanding. The big dog still derivate with about 11 billion, but OKEX coming on strong there, but not quite enough to topple bit.com. Bit.com, a firm number two at about 742 million. OKEX number three, 593 million. Then you got CME all the way there at number four. 470 million. That's as much paper even OKEX and Bit.com are doing. They're, they're trumping CME, the 800-pound gorilla in the space out there. Number five, Ledger X, 334 million. Then you got good old Huobi <laughs> bringing up the rear at 11 million. We won't even talk about backed because they're still at the goose egg, unfortunately. How's this OI line up in terms of calls versus puts? A little bit closer than you might think. You know, Traditionally, it's kind of been all calls all the time, particularly as you go Farther out and down the term structure, get a little bit longer term in the Bitcoin space. It's all the holders got to have their calls, right? But these days right now, given where we are in these, shall we say, lofty valuation levels, uh, puts are starting to get up there a little bit. We're seeing 104,000 contracts open on the call side of the ledger and puts only, or I should say puts coming up at about 92,000. I know, Greg, like I said, long term, it's traditionally very call heavy. Are you surprised that we're seeing as many puts open out there right now as we are, or is that maybe not surprise you given where we are from a valuation perspective? From a theoretical perspective, yes, it definitely surprises me, especially as we're sort of breaking these new all-time highs, went straight through 50,000 and people are gunning for 100,000. So I would expect sort of the activity to be a lot more to the call side given the sort of price action. But we've actually noticed, um, we, we've written about a couple, t- couple times in the past week about the skew itself starting to become, you know, less positive and, and even touching negative territory, which kind of implies that there's this appetite for, for downside protection. And so I think what we're seeing in the market is that either people who are, who are just kind of naturally long Bitcoin want to hedge and, and, and lock in some of their profits, or there's some, some sort of appetite from speculation on a potential pullback. So Looks like we got a little bit of that pullback today, but nothing major. And so I think that's where the appetite for the put side is coming. And you're seeing that in the OI and you're seeing that in the SKUs. You're also seeing that in the volume numbers. Post Musk, we've seen a lot of heavy volume hitting the tape. And this past week was no exception. Multiple days north of one and a half billion worth of notional going up out there on Deribit land. 1.6 billion going up on the 17th, 1.7 billion going up. On the 19th, so far today, we had about 1.3 billion on the tape coming into showtime. But as today continues, we could see a lot more paper hitting the tape as well. So those are pretty strong numbers. They're pretty much up there, if not eclipsing most of the other most active days. We saw on the 29th, we also hit, of January, we also hit 1.6 billion. It's the only other day that even comes close 
in terms of these numbers out here. So, yeah, that's pretty much these are pretty strong days we have going on out here of late in terms of where people are lining up, where their trades are falling from an expiration perspective. It's still March leading the dance. Crypto does love a quarterly and that continues in Bitcoin land. March monthly expiration has about 65,000 contracts open, followed by February, number two, 52,000. Now, the game changes a little bit. You start adding up all the weeklies in there. It becomes a little bit different. Of course, March has a lot of weeklies now that are very active as well. So interesting to watch. It's still March, but uh, Feb is up there. Of course, Feb's going off the board in about a week or so here. So that'll be interesting to see what's going on with the March. And then, of course, April and then, indeed, June, which is the next quarterly out there in terms of where folks are lining up from a strike perspective <laughs> just looking at these strikes it does bring a bit of a, a smile a bit of laughter to my face here because we i said we just talking about the thirty six thousand strike and how outlandish it seems and now the forty thousand strike is number one with a bullet twelve thousand and guess what it's over ten thousand points in the money <laughs> so it's one of those one of those data points that you kind of have to just laugh at. The number two is the 48,000 strike with almost 10,000 contracts open, about 9,800. The number three, way back in the rearview mirror, the 20,000 strike with about 9,200. Greg mentioned they're starting to add the CME data, not the biggest week out there from an options perspective over there on CME land. The biggest day last week was uh, Tuesday at about 111 uh, contracts, even though they had a decent paper going up on last Friday, 147 hitting the tape. So we'll see if they're starting to see better numbers, you know, triple digits. That's a good sign. Remember, that's a, a 5X multiplier, but still the numbers have been kind of anemic. So seeing days with over 100 contract volume at CME is a good thing. Futures wise, a bit of a different beast. They've been pretty active of late today, about 17,000 contracts on the tape coming into showtime last Friday, 16,000. On Thursday, it was 11,000, 13,000 on Wednesday, and 21,000 on Tuesday. Remember, we were closed here in the U.S. for the President's Day holiday. Greg, you said you're working on incorporating CME data over there at GVOL right now alongside Deribit and everything else you guys are crunching the numbers for over there. Are you surprised that we're still still seeing the, the numbers we're seeing out of CME, or do you think this is going to start kicking into high gear, sir? Yeah, so I think one of the big problems right now still with CME is that there's, a, there's sort of a lack of liquidity. I mean, there's the, the latter has bids and asks across sort of the first three expirations and quite a few strikes, but it's just that the market is so wide. So if you're trying to trade any sort of complicated complicated strategy that has more than one contract, you're, you're really getting scalped on, on the bidding and ask spread. So without like executing through an RFQ system, like our partners at Paradigm would do, it, it's almost impossible to trade them profitably. Um, so I think sort of these smaller venues, whether it's Darebit or Bit.com or LedgerX or even uh, some of the on-chain solutions, for smaller traders, that's just going to be the way to go. Like not only do you not have to deal with this, this super beefy contract, but also you're going to have a tighter spread and, and more liquidity to get in and out of trades. So I think until we sort of see tighter markets and we and maybe the contract is just too big. I mean, a 5x contract on a you know fifty thousand dollar underlying is just it's just out of out of most people's range if you're if you're trading options uh, and you're not like a institutional trader. So I, I think that that combination of the two things is kind of slowing down the adoption. I do think these CME contracts are very good solutions for sort of institutional clients because they're they're trading you know big accounts and and these contract sizes make sense for them and there's a decent amount of liquidity in the future space. But for smaller traders who are trading the option side of the uh, of the product, um, it's a little bit tough. Yeah, you know, it is an interesting dichotomy to watch the futures doing so much. They obviously have to have the same size issue going on with them and yet not impeding them from a volume perspective. In fact, I put this to the folks at CME who handle the crypto side over there. I, I was curious why they thought they're seeing such a dichotomy between, you know, the, the Bitcoin futures doing so much numbers and the options still kind of lag. And they had an interesting idea. They thought that because Bitcoin's moving around so much, you're actually getting a fair degree of volatility, indeed, a fair degree of optionality from the future. So for a lot of people, that could be perhaps solving their options needs. What do you think about that, Greg? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I don't really buy that argument. I think the options 
you know, profiles are a little bit different. I wouldn't want to trade a Delta one because there's so much volatility. I'd rather trade an option and a Delta one to sort of structure the position that I want. But that's me personally. I mean, I don't run the exchange, so maybe they have better insight than I do. Now, that is the one real sad factor about all this going on that we're talking about here, Greg. We've seen an asset rally from around 3,000 at its nadir in the crypto winter all the way to north of 50,000 right now with a dearth of listed tradable options available for the U.S. audience, which is obviously the, you know, the primary audience for our network. We love our international listeners as well. We know you're out there, but for all of our U.S. listeners, it's been a challenge. You know, you can go to your Ledger X's, you could trade the big beefy things over there at your, you know, CMEs. And that's kind of about it, unless you want to tunnel into like, a, you know, Deribits or some of the others out there, which is all sorts of challenges from a EULA and a legal and everything else perspective. Out there. So Greg, imagine if we had had robust listed U.S. tradable options here throughout this entire run, what a different story would be, Greg. I think it would have been amazing. I mean, if, if I think of, you know, uh, a Bitcoin ETF, I mean, we have GBTC, which is decent, but, you know, it's a pink, pink sheet listed ETF. If we had a sort of a pro shares ETF, Bitcoin ETF with some liquid options, oh man, something like SPY liquidity, that would be, that would be amazing. Yeah, well, maybe this recent run, it does seem to have rekindled the talk of a Bitcoin ETF. And you're right, that's kind of been the silver bullet everyone's been waiting for. They can approve one of those. The floodgates are open. They have approved some stuff in Canada. Some folks are hoping maybe that'll pave the way. Because once you get that Bitcoin ETF listed here, the folks here can trade it in the securities account. They can trade options on it. Then then it's a whole different ball game. And you know what else is a whole different ball game? It's the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe. All right, let's get to it. Welcome to the altcoin universe where we explore everything else that's been lighting up the <laughs> the world of altcoins since our last show. And oh, quite a bit. <laughs> we saw a brief, ever so brief. For a, a sprint for Dogecoin into the top 10. Let's see if we can break in there today. Oh, spoiler alert. No, it's not there this week. <laughs> Listeners, number 10 is Bitcoin Cash at about $11.3 billion overall market cap. Remember, take these overall market caps with a nice, healthy grain of salt. But the rankings are where the, the value really lies. Number 9, Chainlink at about $12.2 billion. Number 8, Litecoin, $13.4 billion. Number 7, all the way down at number 7. Our old friend XRP, 27 point, almost 2 billion. We had a decent, decent week out here. We'll get to that in a little bit, but it's just knocked down to number seven. Number six, Cardano at about 31, almost 32 billion. Number five, Polkadot, 32 billion, pretty much even. Number four, Tether. That's got knocked down to number four as well. That's been firm at number three for a while. Tether, 34 and a half billion. Number three, Binance Coin, knocking down Tether. Binance Coin now at 39, just a tick under 40 billion. Number two, it's ETH. 198 billion. You know what the big dog is. Bitcoin, as of showtime, 998 billion market cap. <laughs> you know, we, we touched on it earlier, Greg, uh, but we had the poll just not that too long ago, a few weeks ago, barely a month ago here on the show, where we only half jokingly asked our listeners, you know, which of these names do you think will hit 1 trillion market cap first? Tesla. Or Bitcoin. Never did we imagine that they would join forces like Voltron to become one thing effectively for a bit there. But uh, everyone pretty much voted for Tesla in our poll. And it seems like they had it wrong. It was the other way around. Did you ever imagine the next time you came on the show, Greg, we'd be talking about the 1T market cap level for Bitcoin? Sir? Yeah, it's uh, quite a milestone. I remember kind of thinking that total market cap of $1 trillion made it was like kind of the the big target to, to look at. Can we get the total crypto market cap to one trillion? And uh, now we got Bitcoin alone right there, and then plus the all all the other coins. So that's pretty interesting. And just to put it in perspective, you know, gold's got a twelve trillion market cap, around twelve tr trillion. Um, so, you know, we're gaining we're gaining way on the gold market cap, and and gold has sort of been the monetary standard for you know millenniums. So that's just something to uh, to think about. It's very interesting. Certainly is an interesting perspective. Let's go on out to the other big altcoin out there that's a lot of people are focused on these days, which is ETH. Actually taking a little bit of a break, at least since we talked about it on our Tuesday rundown last week off nearly 11 handles. It was about 173 and a half 
on that show. It's about 117, 23 and a half, excuse me. Uh, so almost 11 handles down there. Even though in between on Saturday, we did see it flirt ever so briefly with the 2000 level. I think they hit about 2040 before it backed off over there. So, Greg, it kind of puts the lie to the fear a lot of people had in Ethland because since the last time you and I talked about a week and change ago, CME launched the Ether Futures, and we all know what happened when they launched the Futures on Bitcoin. A lot of people view that as the beginning of the crypto winter. You could finally sell it. You could sell it short, of course, as well, and that led to a bit of a downward spiral in price action. Some folks thought, oh, maybe this might happen with ETH, but no, Greg, it didn't happen. In fact, they hit a new record of market cap out there, a price action really as well for about 2004. I know you're a big fan of ETH. What's been lighting up your tape over there at Genesis from an ETH perspective, sir? Yeah, so definitely some interesting stuff with ETH kind of to come back to the futures market launch. So yeah, I've, I've argued a lot a lot with people about sort of that narrative that launching the futures could be a bearish thing because you get to short it and everyone kind of looks back at Bitcoin. I think what sometimes people miss is that Bitcoin rallied on the news of an Ethereum future being launched by CME. And and Bitcoin went from around $3,000 or $4,000 in the summer all the way up to $20,000 in December when, when the future did launch. So I think it just kind of quint- it had a, it coincided with, with a, a, a needed correction. I don't think the future itself was the cause necessarily for sort of the sell-off in Bitcoin back, back a couple of years ago. I think another dynamic to kind of think about is that now there's a lot of futures products in the crypto crypto space. So people have been able to be short crypto assets for quite a few quite a few years now. So the, the notion that launching an Ethereum futures an Ethereum future product would allow traders to get short for the first time. I think the the fundamental market dynamics have now changed, and and that is not a new concept for Ethereum. We've been able to short Ethereum for quite a, quite a long time now. So that's why I don't think there's sort of that same bearishness on the on the Ethereum futures launch. I think a few things that are really interesting on Ethereum from a fundamental perspective. Um, so you have Ethereum basically uh, launching the beacon chain for Ethereum 2.0. You have some of these exchanges such as Coinbase that are going to offer staking on Ethereum. So basically Ethereum is going to have a yield now. So if you stake your ETH 1.0 into the beacon chain and you have ETH 2.0, you basically going to yield around seven and a half percent, and that's a service that Coinbase is going to be offering. It's a service that Kraken offers, so on and so forth. Something that's very interesting in the future space in the new CME future that just launched, and I'm wondering to see how this plays out. So, for example, uh, the current future that it's, that's expiring in about four days is trading around seventeen eighty right now, and then if you're looking at Three months from now, the future is trading about 1880. So there's sort of a premium of of $100 on the Ethereum future uh, with 100 days total delivery. But what's interesting is that if ETH is a yielding asset, you should have like more of a backwardated futures curve because the, the yield should be brought out. So there's just going to be an arbitrage there. So I actually think that future... Um, Ethereum futures calendars could be really interesting. There's probably some sort of pricing inefficiency right there. And then from a volatility perspective, so kind of two things. Um, we've had sort of this vol- this realized volatility squash over the past week as Ethereum's just consolidated around the $2,000 mark for so long that that volatility pretty much just got squashed for, with the exception of today with the, with the pullback. So we're seeing a huge uh, premium in the implied vol market versus the realized vol market. So, for example, the implied vol market is pricing around 130% vol for between 10 to 20 days. And then a 10-day realized vol is about 110. So there's definitely something there. There's definitely some juice uh, being priced into these options. I do think there is uh, an opportunity to short vol in, in, in this context. But... That being said, there's also sort of this this risk of, well, what happens if Elon Musk says he wants to allocate a billion dollars to Ethereum on his balance sheet as well, or what happens if um, you know some other you know uh, uh, some other co- private company decides to add you know diversify their their crypto exposure to, to Ethereum. So I definitely think, although the ball is juicy to sell here, 
there, there's a, there's a little bit of this sort of this tail phenomenon. So you wouldn't want to just do that naked. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. But yeah, we're seeing a lot of opportunity on both those fronts. Let's talk about some of that juice out there. The one hour vol last week on the Tuesday kind of rundown, it was about almost 130%, 128%. And it's still around that level right now out there in Eastland, about 132%. So we haven't seen a huge vol swing over the course of the past week. A skew wise, bit of a different story. Uh, we were talking about a, a 17 in the positive direction. Remember, that's that 30 20 skew that Greg just broke down earlier about how they do it with Bitcoin. Same deal with ETH coming into today's show. Now it's about a negative 0.26. So it swung quite a bit <laughs> in the other direction. Of course, a lot of this also reflected in the strong volume numbers we're seeing out there from an ETH options perspective. Again, going out to the, the notional value of what's going up out there. Most days of the past week were. North, all of them were pretty much north of 175 million, I think, except for one. And 220 million was hit multiple times, including today, which is is pretty pretty high up there. Uh, we saw some other previous highs back earlier this year, the January 4th, uh, 264 million, and the 19th, 286 million. So didn't quite hit that last week, but we had multiple days coming close to it. So it was a pretty active week out there from an overall ETH options perspective. It's also reflected out there. And the OI, remember, a little bit of a smaller contract here. So these numbers a little bit higher than what we're seeing from an overall contract perspective out there in Bitcoin land. 804,000 contracts open on the call side, 625,000 contracts open on the puts. And in terms of open interest, hour by hour on our last show, is just shy of 1.3 million, about 1.28 million. Now it's about 1.4, a little bit north of that, actually, about 1.4 one million. It's interesting to see what happens to these numbers once February rolls off the board. If we see a huge culling like we saw at the end of January, there probably will be. We'll see how quickly it makes it up. But if these if these notional volume numbers are going to continue, that's that's a lot of paper hitting the tape. Probably won't take long for that for to make those numbers back up. In terms of where you're landing from an overall expiration cycle perspective, where you folks are trading out there right now, it's March again. ETH in particular tends to like a quarterly, 434,000 contracts open in the monthly March contract. We're not even adding in the weeklies. This is just the monthly expiration. Feb has about 313,000. That's all going the way of the dodo in a few days, listeners. It'll be interesting to see how this uh, repositions, if it goes into April, if it goes out into June, which is starting to come on strong as well, threatening a quarter of a million contracts open already. Again, going back to that narrative that crypto does like a quarterly. I'm curious about this, Greg. I'd like to get your opinion on this because I know you're a hardcore ETH guy. You've been watching and trading in this space for a long time. Uh, the strikes in ETH are very fascinating to me as well. We talked about kind of the outlandish upside strikes that we have open and trading. Not that much upside anymore. They're actually in the money now, but they were outlandish upside not too long ago in Bitcoin. We kind of have the opposite issue in ETH. The number one strike, and it has been for some time, out here, the 400 strike, which, like I said, we just crossed the 2000 level last weekend, listeners. At about a 1700 and change coming into showtime. So that's roughly one fourth of where ETH is trading right now. It's about 87,000 contracts open. That's about the same as it was on our last show. The second strike, second most active in terms of open interest, not, well, I shouldn't say most active, the second most sizable position that is open out there is the 480 strike. Again, that number hasn't decreased either it's still about the same open interest as it was on our last strike then number three is the 320 strike Sixty-eight thousand open there again about the same none of these have come off at all you got to go all the way out to number four to get a strike that's even remotely relevant that's the 1600 strike with about sixty-seven thousand contacts open that's added about three thousand since our last show greg does that surprise you that you have these extremely deep in the money strikes that are still dominating the tape, or maybe does that not surprise you? It's the, it's the hardcore ETH holders and they don't care if you blow a thousand points through their strike, they're still holding on to those bad boys. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I, I actually do find that a little bit surprising. I think part of that flow must have been pre kind of breakout. So I think, you know, over summer, we were trading that range. So maybe people established position, positions back then and sort of just held on to them. Uh, but then also what we saw uh, about two weeks ago was we saw some deep in the money paper go through on Bitcoin. So we were seeing 16,000 16, June calls being traded against 18,000 December calls. 
And there's this really weird deep in the money diagonal 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 paper. And we're sort of wondering what's that flow? Like, what are people doing? Um, and it turns out that actually that flow is really a good way to trade future spreads. And so if you're seeing a lot of this deep in the money paper going through, it's it's less of a options position and more of trading sort of the June spread versus the June future versus the uh, December future and getting some sort of synthetic exposure to future spreads. So I, I definitely think there's an appetite there as well for this deep in the money paper from, from a futures perspective. Yeah, it's fascinating. Obviously, at this point, it's pretty much a future. <laughs> There's not, not much of an option left to it at this point. But fascinating stuff. I keep expecting these strikes to wind down. Because like I said, they have been open for some time, for several months at least now. And we haven't really seen them decrease. We haven't really seen them. We've seen them add a little bit. But it's mostly, it's just been fascinating to watch. You think at a certain point, someone would come in and take a good bunch of this off the board and maybe reposition it, readjust it, take some profits as you I know that's heresy in the world of crypto, but you are allowed to take some profits every now and then out there. Let's see what's going on from an other leading altcoin perspective. Uh, Ripple actually having a decent run up, not quite 10 cents, about 9 cents. Uh, So threatening that 60 cent level uh, coming into today's show is about 51 cents on our last show. So it's had a nice little ride. You know, it keeps rallying up to this 60 to 75 level. Then it gets chopped down again. I said before, they seem like there are some, some sellers lurking out there. They're on that 75 cent level and they just, they get that chance to unload it. When then when they do, they hit it. So that does seem like it keeps XRP down. Of course, there have been some other negative headlines that have kind of been lurking to not quite have XRP get caught up in the crypto tsunami that seems to be carrying everything else along with it also has been carrying a uh, bitcoin cash and bitcoin sv to the downside at least uh, since our last check-in on tuesday there 77 points to the dark side for bitcoin cash and bitcoin sv down about 21 points uh, since uh, since tuesday also you know what's up ever so slightly 0.0017 is doge i have to ask you about this greg this has kind of been the the story Outside of Bitcoin and E, the Doge has kind of been what everyone has been talking about. You know, it started off as a joke. It was hard to take it seriously. And yet it became very real for some time. As I mentioned, it briefly, ever so briefly, broke into the top 10. So I, we have to know, Greg, when you guys going to start adding the Doge analytics to Genesis? Sir? <laughs> well, I would love it if someone created some on-chain Doge, Dogecoin options. Um, I would say that Doge is... I mean, I've always been bearish Doge. I, I don't own Doge. I don't want to own Doge. Um, but it's sort of been one of these short seller widow makers where there's some exchanges on there where you can actually short Doge. And every once in a while, you get this crazy Doge rally. And so it's one of those things that I just kind of don't want to touch to the short side or the long side. I don't, it's, it's, it's got this meme cult following that it's, it's hard to bet against. And at the same time, like I wouldn't want to have any of my, my net worth or life savings uh, associated to it either. So you're not throwing a bunch of doge in the back pocket for a rainy day out there to use it to fund the continued evolution of Genesis volatility, Greg? <laughs> nope. I am not sure what I dislike more, fiat or doge. It's a tough one. <laughs> well, if you don't like fiat, stay tuned for some of our listener comments. I think they'll be along with you as we head right on into the crypto questions. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right, like I mentioned, you guys have many thoughts on many different aspects of the crypto marketplace. Let's kick it off here with Revon Gorge's regular listener, regular writer and chimer inner. He says, I see Bitcoin mining stocks going up like Riot and Mara. And yeah, Revon, they have been moving quite a bit of late. Uh, He goes on to write, but isn't it cheaper to just buy Bitcoin or the crypto and just hold it yourself. Is there any advantages to buying into the Bitcoin, into the mining companies? It seems like they just charge a percentage uh, to buy Bitcoin. I, th- I think it depends <laughs> what you mean by cheaper. I think a lot of people are looking at this. It's the same th- reason we see, you know, USO trade in a lot of the equity accounts out there versus, you know, the futures out there on WTI or the options on the futures. People want to be able to put it in a securities account first and foremost. So these mining stocks and, and ETFs like USO and others, or maybe the forthcoming Bitcoin ETF, they serve that function. They allow you to put it 
in your traditional securities account without having to open up, let's say, a Coinbase or a Kraken or a futures account to trade the futures out there, whatever the case may be. It's all in one account. That's appealing to a lot of people. Be cheaper. Uh, I mean, look at we were just talking about about Bitcoin. Obviously, at north of fifty thousand, you have Mara, even though it's it's inflated quite a bit of late. This is at thirty seven. 65. So people are looking at that just from a basic mathematic perspective. They say, hey, I can buy a couple of thousand shares of that maybe or a couple of hundred at the very least. I can't even buy one Bitcoin. So they probably are doing that math as well. You can take issues with that. But from an overall capital allocation perspective, they could allocate and get a larger piece of the pie in a Mara or in a Riot than they can in Bitcoin. Also, these bad boys are usually are optionable, at least so that you have the additional fun of being able to trade an actual listed option on something that holds Bitcoin. I think that has a lot of interest and value to people out there as well. So cheaper is a relative term. Obviously, these things are inflated. Their valuations, I'm not going to argue about their valuations. That, that, I'll, I'll let the folks <laughs> go out there and do this. Looks like Mara topped out at 47.90. It's off about 10 points from there, let's see how high Riot got in the fervor out there. It got up to 77.90s at now 65.70 or so. So both of them off their recent apexes out there in the Musk frenzy. But still, you know, we teach people on our network to trade options themselves rather than buying these structured products because they do charge you exorbitant fees to do things you could do yourself, like buy a put. You don't need to pay someone a percentage to do that. You can do that yourself. So there is an argument to be made that if you want to just go out and you have the savvy to do it and you could allocate your capital efficiently, then yeah, go trade the underlying. But I think for a lot of folks who they want to try to swing for the fences, think maybe they miss the boat on Bitcoin. They don't do the back of the napkin math, that, that massive valuation. <laughs> Out there in Bitcoin ties into this valuation here on Bitcoin. And if that comes in, that could, of course, hurt these numbers as well. But I think there's a lot of that driving this action as well, Revon. Uh, Greg, is that your thought as well? Why folks are piling into some of these equities rather than Bitcoin itself, sir? Yeah, 100%. And and some of these equities have shown a, a higher beta as well with respect to, to percentage gains versus Bitcoin. What's interesting, though, is that the vol on some of these companies are, is so much higher than than Bitcoin. And you've actually seen sort of a breakdown in the past week uh, of that beta. So for example, MicroStrategy pretty much did nothing last week and, and Bitcoin continued to rally all the way up to 58,000. And so you have this, this differential in sort of price action, yet the MicroStrategy implied ball is trading something around, you know, out of the money options is trading around 170, whereas the Bitcoin vol is going to be trading around like 105, 110. So there's sort of like this implied ball that to be done as well. So there's definitely some stuff to be, to be, uh, some opportunities to be mined there between the two, uh, underlying commodity itself, the, the Bitcoin and, and the company equities. Yeah, they are optional. I'm looking at Mara right now. If you're wondering, uh, the at the money ball is about 171% out there in uh, the Mara front month options going out at the end of this week. Again, that's a weekly, so it's mostly gamma at that point, but still fascinating stuff afoot. Good question out here. Last show, we had uh, a buddy, Mr. Bill Ulaveri from Seneca Capital on. He was, we were just talking about it was right not that long after the whole Tesla Bitcoin brouhaha. And Bill said he didn't like it when companies got out of their core competencies. He said he was more negative on Bitcoin and Tesla as a result. And we had a listener, Richard Bruce, chime in saying they hold cash on the balance sheet and now they hold some Bitcoin. Uh, what competency are we talking about? One is fixed in supply, which is Bitcoin, he puts in parentheses. The other U.S. dollars is being printed at an exponential rate. Uh, the Bitcoin sits there and life goes on, does not affect Tesla business. Obviously, this is a contentious issue. You combine Anything Tesla with Bitcoin, you're going to have the Venn diagram of the two people who trade them, A, are very, they overlap quite a bit. And B, they tend to be, shall we say, opinionated about, about those positions out there. So, yeah, Bruce taking the other side of that. What are your thoughts in general, Greg, on, on Tesla and indeed uh, Mr. Papa Musk there just diving in with both feet on all things Bitcoin and then pumping it up to his Twitter followers? <laughs> Well, besides being hilarious, I think it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. So I definitely think private companies allocating balance sheet to crypto is extremely bullish for crypto, and it gives crypto a lot of validity. Uh, I think the perspective of, as, as an investor, if I own a portfolio, and I own a portfolio of all these equities, and I own Tesla, and I own 
you know, all these other tech companies. And these tech companies decide to start allocating balance sheet uh, to Bitcoin from an investor's perspective. I do think that it, it's a little bit of a, a divergence or it's, it's not exactly what I'm looking for. I bought companies because I think that company has an edge in that sector. And if I want to some Bitcoin to my portfolio as an investor, I can just go ahead and add Bitcoin as an allocation to my portfolio. I don't need the CEO of a private company to add Bitcoin to their balance sheet to get me exposure as, a, as an investor. So I do think there's sort of like a portfolio concentration risk that you know uh, mutual funds and people like that should think about. I also think that private companies, you know, buying into the notion of of Bitcoin, seeing the idea that we can't just print infinity money, there's consequences to it. Also, sort of, it's kind of a next, you know, you know Bitcoin's a global asset, so there's a little bit of this idea that. You know, you know, not only am I leaving fiat, but as an American company, I'm also leaving sort of the U.S. dollar system as well. So there's, there's sort of that perspective as well. So long story short, if I'm a mutual fund investor, I need to, to understand that my, 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 my portfolio is getting concentrated with risks that I might have not thought about before. As a crypto enthusiast and as a believer in crypto myself, uh, I think it's great for the space, extremely bullish. And uh, I'm definitely happy to see it. And I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Well said, sir. I, I like it. Of course, you did also did dare to say negative things about and Bitcoin and or Papa Musk. So they're going to be coming for you on Twitter. Just to prepare yourself there, sir, <laughs> <laughs> as we go forward here. Next, we got uh, Cash in Co. He also had thoughts on what Bill said on the show last time. Uh, he said he was laughing his butt off, to use the family-friendly version there. He says, as Elon says, Tesla is a collection of 12 different startups. Crypto looks like a new division of that collection. And then he added, for good measure, three unicorn emojis. <laughs> well, there you go. Crypto is now the latest startup division of Tesla. They already got, what, SpaceX in there. They got the solar stuff. They got everything in there. So why not have a crypto division? as well concrete jack he's part of looks like the doge army here he says after our last show as well we were talking about doge how could you not he said you should probably dump 500 bucks into doge and forget about it for a few years it's the more popular crypto with the younger people there you go so it's probably a sure thing got 5098 shares for 440 bucks today he says it's a low risk trade out there so there you go Greg, uh, Mr. Concrete Jack, taking the other side of your trade, he says, the hell with it. I'm throwing 500 bucks I never want to see again into Doge, sir. What do you think about that? I mean, that's a, that's a very like reasonable way of doing it. If you're spending $500 and you know, you're, you're just playing for sort of a you know, what-if scenario, that's totally chill. I, I'm talking about if you're putting like, you know, a large significant portion of your net worth into it, I think there's just so many better projects with so much more kind of revolutionary concepts to it that I, I almost think that um, there's an opportunity cost to owning Doge as opposed to like, uh, like an Ethereum or a Polkadot or, or some of these DeFi projects. I mean, there's so many interesting DeFi projects and Doge is just not one of them. I got more, more Doge comments. We had yeah, Bill on the show last time said Doge is a joke. We have he's exact same comment you just made here greg bill said we have real projects in crypto that are making a real impact on the world but they can't catch a break yet doge is making all of this news i question my own sanity sometimes <laughs> and uh, anacott steel by the way great handle throwback to the old wall street movie lear listeners if you don't know that one uh, he right he just responded to that and said the power of the messiah elon well yeah he certainly did he did of course throw some love doge's way as well so that of course accounting for a lot of the move. But we also said uh, one of our shows last week, I think it was my been the option block. Uh, we said, forget silver. The most crowded short trade out there is in the dollar. This is your, I think this was your buddy there, Mr. Meatball, AKA Mr. Sebastian. Cause I think this is a complete setup and the silver squeeze don't really amount to much. That was heading into that big, all that talk of, okay, here was the next big short squeeze. It was silver. And Colby Wilson wrote in with the, the most crypto of all crypto responses. He says, F the dollar, hashtag Bitcoin. <laughs> I like that. Also, let's, let's wrap it up on this one. A little bit of love. These guys have written in before. I think Mer Petual chiming in, but chiming in again, just saying uh, they, they, they like your stuff, Greg. They picked up on Genesis Vol because they listened to the show and they said they became exposed to a whole nother ball game, as he puts it, Bitcoin and ETH derivatives and complex data 
aggregated onto a semi-free platform. You guys, Genesis Vol, have interesting data for Bitcoin options. So there you go, Greg. The listeners throwing a little love the Genesis Vol way, sir. Oh, I love it. I love to hear it. That's very nice. One of the questions that I get all the time, and I think this is just a perfect response, one of the questions I get all the time is, should I trade stock options or should I trade stocks or should I trade crypto options or underlying? And the response that I say all the time is, when you're trading stocks, there's people who've been doing doing that game for you know 70 years and, and they have a lot of experience and a lot of information edge on you. When you're trading crypto, it's almost anyone's game. It's like a brand new asset class. It's a paradigm shifting asset class. No one even thought about digital assets 15 years ago and and so it's it's a level playing field so if you're gonna cut your teeth in one of the spaces might as well uh start with a level playing field and start building an edge in, in being around for a while and getting experience in these markets well said sir unfortunately that music means we've come to the end of yet another epic journey through the world of all things crypto. Man, we talked about so much today. Bitcoin, the skew, the volume, the volatility, all that good stuff and a whole bunch more. ETH, <laughs> XRP, Dogecoin, your thoughts on all of the above. Through some Tesla in there as well as a whole bunch more. Remember, you guys have comments or questions. You know where to find us. You guys have no shortage of opinions on all this stuff. Add options on most of the major social media platforms. Of course, head over to theoptionsinsider.com and hit us up there as well. Of course, you can always leave comments. And of course, remember, if you like the show, rate and review it in all the platforms. It gets available everywhere, adding new platforms all the time. I think Amazon Music just added it not too long ago everywhere else. So it's pretty much available anywhere you can get audio at this point. So keep rating and review. It does help the new folks, particularly out there in the crypto realm, discover these crazy things we're talking about called options. And Greg, if our listeners are like perpetual here and they want to discover the Genesis volatility platform and all you guys are bringing to the table, where should they go? What should they do? Yes, yeah, so you can follow us on Twitter. We have a Twitter handle at Genesis Fall. We have a weekly newsletter where we basically recap some of the activity in, in the crypto options market. That's, that can be found at genesisvolatility.substack.com. And lastly, our product, our product suite, which has a free tier and a premium tier, is found at gvol.io. That's G-V-O-L dot I-O. There you go. gvol.io is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. If you like all this stuff we're talking about, the one-hour vol, the 30-20 skew, the changes in open interest, the strikes that are open, the months, all that stuff comes from the Genesis Volatility Platform. So check it out, gvol.io. If you're trading these, if you're learning about this space, I I can't imagine doing it without that sort of data in hand. Genesis Volatility, gvol.io is the place to go. And on behalf of Greg and Adi, myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live, for sending in so many great, many and varied opinions and thoughts and questions. Keep them coming. We'll be back again tomorrow course interview tuesday then on again to education wednesday remember options boot camp options playbook radio two shows for a lot of you out there maybe in this audience who are not as familiar with all things options those are two great low stress ways to get up to speed about these options things and thursday we're back with a double dose of twifo and a second episode of the option block friday volatility views then it all kicks off again next week on monday with another episode of the option block and then right on into another episode of the crypto rundown This program is brought to you by Genesis Volatility, also known as GVOL, home of institutional grade crypto options analytics. Whether you're trading CFI options or DeFi options, cryptocurrencies move. Use GVOL analytics to analyze implied volatility, model realized volatility, structure positions, and unlock alpha. For more information, visit GVOL.io. That's G-V-O-L dot I-O. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. 
Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.